Hi, now let's discuss about the final treatment of cancer, especially the challenges and opportunities and personalized medicine and cancer treatment and more general phase uh, of clinical trials. So what are the challenges and opportunities in cancer therapy? We have spent the decades and decades uh, of research funding, and but still uh, the progress has been marginal in terms of patient survival. So we can ask, people will ask, when's the cancer going to be cured? Uh, that is very difficult to cure all kinds of cancer because if the cancer is a genetic term, as we say, is a malignant neoplasm, cancer is not as a single disease. Uh, in fact, I, I will write, I will read uh, Bob Weinberg's in the textbook of biology of cancer. The cancer is a really a collection of more than 100 diseases. What it means is each of these affecting the distinct cell or tissue type in the body. So what we know for even some breast cancer alone, there are at least eight different distinct histopathological categories. And each of these categories following its own reasonably predictable clinical course and existing its own responsiveness to specific forms of therapy. So even within the breast cancer, there are various different subtypes of breast cancer that will respond to differently from different treatment. So with this a variety of the, the characteristic of cancer, the future cancer diagnosis and, uh, will be a little different rather than train the eyes of a pathologist, which is still a gold standard, uh, later on we will be more molecular level and based on bioinformatics. So especially we use a monotherapy, meaning that just one type of therapy, that is very limited to yield in, in ultimate curative treatment. Because when we give a monotherapy a cancer type, let's say one type of chemotherapy alone, then it's very likely that initially tumor shrink and we can resect the tumor and later on it may recur and, and, and that time that the same therapy will not be as effective and the tumor keeps growing. That is we call recurrence and resistance to a, that specific monotherapy. The reason is the genome of cancer cells are usually not stable. They undergo multiple mutations so that they eventually develop a way to avoid that monotherapy by developing a resistant mechanism. So that become a big problem that why cancer is such a hard disease. And we also call that as a genetic plasticity of the tumor cell populations, which is very heterogeneous. If the single uniform, then we can use one single monotherapy to kill all the cancer cells, but that's not the reality. And so that gives us a logic of multidrug therapy that because certain cancer cell phenotypes can be achieved through combined action for several genetic or epigenetic alterations. So we come up with a a combination therapy, if there's a multiple uh, mechanisms in, involved in the cancer, that may give us a better chance to shrink the tumor and treatment. So not that long time ago, we also discovered that there may exist stem-like cells in even cancer cell population. And that poses a, a bigger problem for tumor treatment because um, our anti-cancer drug development try to kill majority of the tumor cell. However, what if there's a very resistant, a strong cancer stem cell? So then that stem cell, you know, remember that the, the characteristics of stem cell that are also limited uh, proliferative potential. So even if the majority of tumor mass is gone, that cancer stem cells still uh, survive and repopulate and recur tumor. That is a problem. So if we know cancer stem cell well enough, 
then maybe our focus should direct to target that cancer stem cells. And um, important uh, ways of developing treatment is our study with a preclinical, meaning that not with a human, but with uh, laboratory animals uh, to develop a model which will mimic the clinic well enough. So this is very important because this is more controllable. So we develop predictive preclinical models of human cancer. One example is we study human tumor uh, implanted into, let's say, animals, uh, an, a rodent, mice, and the problem is it's a different species, so we sometimes use a mouse with a lacking immune system, such as a, a nude mice, uh, so that we, our human tumors can grow in the mouse. We can uh, treat them with the various ways to test this preclinical model, which we hope to uh, mimic the human conditions. And another difficult challenge is our infect we discussed before that you know the, within the tumor there are not only cancer cells there's non-neoplastic stromal cells so-called tumor stromal cells which in, in, contains uh, fibroblast immune cells blood vessel cells a uh, even uh, lymphatic vessel cells so these are uh, also the interaction between cancer cells and these stromal cells are becoming also important to understand what's going on. Um, so this will also determine the responsiveness to most drug therapies as well. So let me give you an example that what if, if we uh, give a monoclonal antibody which will block uh, angiogenesis and which is secreted by tumor cells and killing the tumor. And what if the uh, neighboring host stromal cells also secrete angiogenic factors, which is different. Then the angiogenesis will keep happening even if we give an anti-angiogenic drug to tumor. So this can happen and we need to understand the intricate interactions of the tumor and the interaction with the stromal cells uh, within this tumor microenvironment. And uh, an emerging concept is so-called personalized molecular medicine at an affordable cost in which the detailed characteristics of each patient's tumor and genetic constitution can inform the design of a customizable therapy. But the difficulty is our drugs are more like general genetic chemotherapy drug. But if we can distinguish the personal genetic background and those genetic constitution and the characteristics of tumor. If this tumor specifically responds better to this specific type of a drug, then which may be better. But uh, then we have to biopsy the tumor and we have to um, screen these tumor or in, in vitro or in vivo with the various drugs. That will cost a lot and timing would be an issue. But with the more advanced uh, whole genome sequencing, I think we are at the era of knowing more personalized tumor characterization and so that it can lead to personalized molecular medicine. So in the end, uh, cancer by itself will, is, will try to avoid our therapy and try to survive and recur. So sometimes, complete cure of cancer may not be possible or realistic. So realize where core maybe uh, in the future, near future, reducing the cancer to a kind of chronic disease, but we can bearably make it such that, you know, nowadays uh, diabetes treatment, we, we keep the diabetes and we just uh, adapt our lifestyle so that while diabetes is there, we can control them. So that's kind of a chronic disease. We may consider even cancer could be not just life-threatening disease. Uh, we could suppress them, the cancer, and keep them in check 
so that we can consider it as a chronic disease like many other diseases in, in this age. So that could be a realizable goal. And in the future, uh, uh, the, the concept of systems biology will be, will be benefiting our cancer research. So what the, the systems biology means we uh, introduce more quantitative and engineering uh, point of view of understanding the biology of cancer and that biological responses of various human cells, normal cells and malignant cells, and that can be predictable by our mathematical models of these cells and their internal uh, signaling pathway circuitries. So if we know well enough and quantitatively map out the circuitry of the cell survival or proliferation and cancerous state well enough, then we can actually come up with a better treatment and uh, better ways of uh, uh, keeping the tumors in check. So that's our hope. And so in the end, we will ask, why is it so difficult to treat the cancer? Because cancer cells are also part of our cells. So just distinguishing cancer cells from normal cells can be very challenging. So, um, so taking advantages of those differences between cancer cells and normal cells, uh, we know some genetic differences and maybe some differences are more specific to the subtype of the cancer, uh, even to individual person. So for example, genetic is like rapidly growing. Uh, growth is a uh, genetic feature of the cancer. The problem is our, some of the normal cell types are also growing and proliferating. That is, gives a side effect of a chemotherapy. While for example, let's say there's a breast cancer, if we know more detailed of subtype, such as HER2, human epidermal growth factor receptor to positive breast cancer, which was actually giving a poor prognosis in the past. Now, after all, we give a, a treatment which is specific to HER2 receptor, which may even effective for those subset of or to positive breast cancer patient that they can even live longer with this uh, targeted therapy drug. So genetic treatment is we know cancer starts from one cell in one place and that will grow as a, a tumor, then we can use uh, surgery. But it's a better, as we saw from before, the prognosis and staging, uh, only detection matters. So where we can find out this uh, cancerous growth only enough stage, the five-year survival rate can be very high. While we know that cancer cells divide faster than normal cells, using that characteristic, we use a radiation to, um, to disrupt the DNA so that the killing those rapidly growing cells and chemotherapy. But these are more generic treatments. The future treatment will involve less side effects uh, and more specific, uh, which is already uh, done these days, hormonal responsiveness, some specific type of prostate cancer and breast cancer. If the cancer cells are, growth is uh, dependent on specific type of hormone, then we can block the action of the hormone effect on the cancer to, to modulate the cancer growth. And some other specific type of cancer is a thyroid cancer, which is uh, coming from the thyroid. And in this case, uh, we can use the thyroid, uh, usually uptake uh, iodine specifically, and, and iodine is not close to the other. So we can come up with iodine with a radioactive element. Then that injection of iodine intake will accumulate in the thyroid and that gives a, a radiation uh, local radiation therapy cell. So that uh, can be a specific trim. And of course, uh, if we find the type of cancer cells uh, and the specific growth factor receptor, then we can target those receptors with a very specific monoclonal antibody. The problem is these drugs will be 
very expensive, but very specific. So supposedly involving less uh, toxic side effects. So lastly, I want to discuss about like a phase of clinical trials because uh, the new drug for uh, generation discovery is important in this business. So it usually starts from laboratory study called preclinical, and we, if there's efficacy and, and um, uh, a positive, then it will enter into phase one and phase two and phase three. So I, here I have a small table which is roughly uh, explaining this phase. So phase one, I put as a, the number of involvement of patient is about 10 to the first order. I'm talking about the order. So about 10 people or 10 to less than 100 people, we give a drug uh, with healthy normal people with by escalating the dose. So we can find out this chemical candidate compound, what is the dose response and escalating the dose until we see side effect. So that, that we call maximum tolerable dose, MTD, uh, to figure out in the phase one. We don't care about whether the drug is effective for the disease, no. We just with the normal people, uh, normal volunteers, we increase the dose and just to see when is the drug can be tolerable. So maximum dose can be determined. And the phase two is 10 to the second order. So several hundred people. Now we are more interested in uh, drug safety and potentially drug has some effect. Okay. And afterwards, this uh, will enter into a third phase. Phase three means now thousands of people. So this will cost a lot. Now we want to really see the efficacy, the effectiveness of drug onto this specific type of a disease, in this cancer. And now we can have a comparative efficacy. So whether this drug can be comparative to the existing drug, then the FDA, or US FDA, Food and Drug Administration, will approve the selling of the drug. So now after this phase three, the drug will be on the market and still we have to check whether there's any remained issues that we call it phase four, which is post approval. And we want to see a long-term efficacy and a potential safety issue, which was neglected or uh, overlooked or didn't come up, uh, show up uh, from previous phases. So here is the summary of clinical trial from Wikipedia. You can take a look at this. <laughs> I just point out there is a phase zero, uh, which I didn't talk about it. It's about pharmacokinetics of the drug, oral bioavailability, and half-life of the drug. So these pharmacokinetic aspects can be studied, uh, which is also very important uh, later on. And also, at the last, I have a drug discovery process here. Uh, the process of discovering, testing, and gaining approval for selling a drug is long, long, and very, very difficult job. So there are like four phases here, research and development, preclinical, clinical trials, and review and approval. So you look at this, it takes almost a decade or even longer time for one single drug to be on the market and well uh, uh, make an impact for patient care. So the research and development, you can see target identification. There are many, many compounds, up to 10,000 compounds will be screened and we will find out uh, lead identification, which is uh, becoming the best uh, chosen one. And then that we will use it for preclinical studies. First with in vitro study, with the cells, in this case, cancer cells, and also, after all, in vivo state, uh, studies. And uh, you see, if to be um, approved for clinical trial, minimum two mammalian species is necessary. Even two mammals and one non-rodent. Means a typical laboratory rodent, such as mice or rats study, is not enough. So to become into the human clinical trial, uh, those toxicities and efficacy studies has to be done with other species such as a rabbit or dogs.
So clinical trial, phase one, usually this uh, less than 100 people, and phase two, uh, less than 1,000, uh, several hundred people, phase three, now a very expensive and long-term study of thousands of people to looking at the efficacy. Um, and, and then it will be, uh, it needs an evaluation and manufacturing and after all post-release monitoring, which is phase four. And I hope this will give you a broad idea of how drugs will be developed and uh, uh, being effective to treat our patient care. So this is summary and thank you.